So today's passage is in Matthew 4, where we've been reading for a while. It's verses 17 through 25, and you can find it on page 809 in the Pew Bibles. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. We are here in the fifth Sunday of Lent, and throughout the season of Lent, we've been working our way through Matthew chapter 4. First half of Matthew chapter 4 is uh, Jesus' wilderness temptation, and the second half of Matthew chapter 4 is Jesus, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And last week, Pastor Joel got us through verse 17, which is a one-sentence summary of the message that Jesus was proclaiming. So you can look here back into verse 417, which is where we're starting uh, this morning. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And repentance is traditionally a major Lenten theme. It's only as we learn to repent and to let go of the things of this world, first the bad and the wicked things, but then even ultimately the good things, that we come to understand and experience the love of God. That's why fasting is so often a part of Lent. Fasting is a letting go of a good thing, even a necessary earthly thing like food, in order to remind ourselves that our truest and deepest food is Jesus. We don't gain our lives by eating the bread of earth. We gain our lives by eating the bread of heaven. And Lenten fasts are a reminder of that. So this morning, I want to spend some more time reflecting on verse 17, connecting Jesus' call to repentance to the theme of judgment and the theme of love, God's judgment and God's love. Some people emphasize God's judgment as the key to repentance. If you want people to repent, then tell them how dreadful the judgment of God is. Other folks emphasize God's love as the key to repentance. If you want people to repent, tell them how tender the love of God is. I want to make my aim is to make clear from this passage that both judgment and love are necessary elements of repentance, but God's judgment and love, they go together in a particular way, in a particular ordering that enables our repentance. And both judgment and love do not get equal emphasis. And we read through the whole of the Bible, we can see both, but they're not emphasized the same. And if we get the ordering and the emphasis wrong, then we're going to impede our own capacity to repent and as we carry the message of Jesus out into the world, we will impede other people's capacity to repent. So this morning will be about how God's judgment and God's love come together to shape our own repentance and teach us how to communicate 
a gospel of repentance. So this is going to be a sermon in two parts. In the first part of the sermon, we're going to look at verse 17 and then back into some of the things that John the Baptist says. We're going to focus on the connection between the call to repentance and God's judgment. And then in the second half of the sermon, we're going to look at the rest of the chapter, uh, verses 18 through 25, and looking and highlighting the connection that Jesus makes between repentance and God's love. All right, so we begin here in verse 17. Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As Pastor Joel noted last week, Jesus is proclaiming the exact same message that John the Baptist was proclaiming. So you can look back in your text here, to chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So both Jesus and John are proclaiming the same message of repentance. The term repentance literally means to change one's mind. So I once thought this way about God, but I've repented, I've changed my mind, and now I think this way about God. But repentance isn't simply a change of one's mind. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. So you can look here in uh, chapter 3, verse 8. The Pharisees and the Sadducees come out, to listen to John, and John tells them in verse 8 to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. To bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If we've truly changed our minds about God, about his word, about his truth, then our lives will reflect the change of mind. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect or that we won't ever stumble. Living consistently with what we believe to be true is difficult in all aspects of our lives, and that's no less true in the life of faith. But if we've truly repented and we've entered into fellowship with God by the Spirit of God, then our lives are going to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, there's a whole sermon that could be preached on that point, but that's not where I want to focus our attention this morning. John's message of repentance and then Jesus's message of repentance prompts us to ask a question. Why? Why is repentance necessary? Perhaps we can phrase it like this to make the point. What happens if we don't repent? Look back at John's message of repentance. We can look and pick it up in uh, verse 7 of chapter 3. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, if you don't know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the religious leaders of John's day, John has a lot of things to say to them about their hypocrisy. Jesus will have a lot of things to say to them about their hypocrisy as well. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. In verse 7, John uses the imagery of vipers fleeing the wrath to come. And some commentators, they connect what John is saying here in verse 7 about vipers fleeing the coming wrath with what John says in verse 10 about fire and in verse 12 about fire. And they say that John is alluding to the ancient farming practice of his day where the farmers would burn the chaff off of a field to clear the field. And as they would burn the chaff off of the field, the snakes in the field would slither out ahead of the flames. Saying this is John's imagery of the Pharisees and the Sadducees as vipers slithering out ahead of the coming wrath. Whatever the imagery John clearly has in mind, a day of divine judgment that he calls a day of wrath. In 310, John says that this day of judgment is at hand. It's like an ax that has been laid to the root of a tree. If you've ever chopped something with a big ax, but if you have, what's the thing that you do right before you begin chopping? You, you lay the ax right in the spot that you intend to strike, 
and then you pull it back and you start swinging. And John is saying that the ax of God's judgment has been laid at the root of the tree. All that's left now is for him to pull it back and begin to strike. It's a sobering picture. It's meant to be a sobering picture. And we do well to be sobered by it because John's message about the coming judgment is no different than Jesus' message about the coming judgment. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which immediately follows in chapters 5, 6, and 7, so we have Jesus' baptism in chapter 3, his wilderness temptation, and then he begins to preach. And so in 5, 6, and 7, we have what Jesus was preaching. And we get a detailed look in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon, what bearing fruit in keeping with repentance actually looks like. It looks like prayer for one's enemies, trust in the Father's provision of daily bread, confessing our sins, not giving way to anger or to lust, being a peacemaker, caring for the poor, and so forth. And then at the end of chapter 7, as Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount, he speaks of the great day of God's judgment. So turn over, just a few pages over, to chapter 7. We can pick up what Jesus is saying in verse 19. This is the end of his Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 19, Jesus says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the exact same message that John was preaching. Jesus is just carrying it out. He's continuing it. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And then Jesus speaks of the great day of judgment. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, which what words of mine is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the words he's just been preaching in his Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 and 6 and 7. Jesus is saying, everyone who has heard these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus is alluding to the days of Noah and the great flood, which was a great picture of God's judgment. John uses the analogy of fire to allude to God's judgment. Jesus uses the analogy of a flood to allude to God's judgment. Fire and flood, these are the Bible's two main metaphors to speak about God's great eschatological last day of judgment. Or to put it in less theologically sophisticated terms, these are the Bible's metaphors to talk about the reality of hell. So Jesus' message, no less than John's message, is a message of repentance. And both Jesus and John are preaching a message of repentance because of the coming judgment, precisely because the kingdom of God is coming. It is at hand. But why does the coming of God's kingdom provoke a message of repentance? Well, it's because the coming of God's kingdom means the end of sin. In the Lord's Prayer, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us how to pray. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray for God's kingdom to come and that, it w- that God's will would be done on earth in the same way that it's being done in heaven, we are praying for the end 
of sin. Because at present, God's will is not being done on earth in the same way that it is being done on heaven. That's why we pray for it. The earth is full of strife and hatred and wickedness and violence and envy and so forth. But when God's kingdom comes to earth, all of that will be done away with and sin will be no more. Now, God is slow to judgment and he's very patient, but he will not forestall his kingdom forever, nor should we want him to. It's not in our best interest or the best interest of the world that he has made to let the, live world, let the world live forever in rebellion. What kind of God would he be if he forever sat by and watched injustice reign upon the earth? If he perpetually turned a blind eye to oppression and tyranny, if he let sin run like a cancer through creation, it's precisely because he loves the world that he judges the sin which threatens to ruin it. As we read in Revelation eleven eighteen, God will one day destroy the destroyers of the earth. This theme of divine judgment as the mechanism of salvation in the world is a major theme all throughout the Bible. You can find it in so many places. I was reading for my devotional reading through the Psalms yesterday, and I saw it again in the Psalms. So let me just read to you from Psalm 96 and 97. You can turn there if you want, or you can just listen as I read. But in Psalm 96, verse 9, the psalmist is talking about this great eschatological day when God's kingdom will finally come and reign over all that God has made. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples in his faithfulness. And then right into Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and injustice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him, and he burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols, Worship him, all ye gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. So the world celebrates the arrival and the coming of the Lord. The trees rejoice, the fields exalt, the forests sing for joy. But not the adversaries of God, not the worthless images and the flammable chaff, and all those who stood opposed to his reign. So before we move on to the message about God's love, we need to reckon with the message of God's judgment. I don't know how you find yourself here this morning. Maybe you are followed Christ for many years and you are trusting him for salvation, but maybe we often have regularly many here who attend who are on the margins of Christianity, right? Who are exploring Christianity. They give space for that. The Lord gives space for that. But if you linger on the banks of the river of life, but you have never stepped in, if your mind has been intrigued by the teachings of Jesus, but has never been changed by it. If you're willing to listen to Jesus as a teacher, but you're not willing to follow him as your Lord, now let me warn you, 
as Jesus warns you. You need to beware of the judgment of God. God is not a senile old man in heaven, a smiling grandpa whose hand is too weak to wield the sword. Nor would you want him to be. You need him to be. We all need him to be. A God who is fully committed to righting all the wrongs and rescuing the oppressed and eradicating all traces of evil. We need a God before whom the whole earth trembles and the mountains melt like wax. A God fully committed to rooting out the sin from the world so that the world can flourish. A God committed to rooting out the sin from our hearts so that you and I can flourish. Because you and I too have been infected by sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, it's judgment. And if we lock our arms with our sin and we refuse to let go, then we must beware lest we are swept away in the flood of God's judgment and burned up like chaff when the fire of God comes to make an end of sin. The book of Revelation speaks of the great final eschatological wrath of the Lord. The whole Bible does at many various points, but the last book of the Bible and the last chapters of the Bible speak of this great final day of the Lord. Let me read to you from Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Again, you're welcome to follow along if you want or just let the words wash over you. But in Revelation 19, the end of Revelation 19, and then again in chapter 20, John, he sees three visions, three great signs or pictures in the heavens that speak of this great day of judgment. In verse 11, he says, Chapter 19, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then John sees an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice calling to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army and the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And then down to chapter 20, verse 11, John's last picture of judgment. This is the last picture of judgment. After this, it will move into the eternal age where sin and death are no more. This is the last final picture of the ending of sin. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were all judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 10, verse 31, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. John preached the coming of the kingdom like a watchman in the night warning about the coming of the rising sun. Jesus himself is the rising sun. He carries the kingdom of God within himself. He is God's kingdom come. And if the axe was laid at the root of the tree with the message of John, it has been raised overhead with the message of Jesus. And we must take care and repent before the sun reaches its noonday zenith. No one knows the day or the hour of the great cosmic eschatological judgment. And no one knows the day or the hour of his or her own personal day of judgment. The Bible says in Hebrews that it's been appointed for man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Are you ready for that day? Whenever it comes. But let me say this. The message of God's judgment, however true and necessary, will not move a person to true repentance. Only the experience of God's love can do that. And that brings us to the second half of the sermon in verse 18, back in Matthew chapter 4. So we turn back to Matthew chapter 4, picking up in verse 18 through 22, Jesus calls his first disciples. He sees Peter and Andrew... And then James and John, they're out fishing, and he calls to them and he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Essentially, he is saying, I am preparing people for the arrival of God's kingdom. Come learn from me and I will teach you also how to prepare people for the arrival of God's kingdom. But before Jesus sends out his disciples to preach his message of repentance, he takes them with him to show them how he preaches his message of of repentance. And that brings us to verses 23 through 25. So let's look back here. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what's the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom is repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's proclaiming this message and he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God, the message of repentance, but along with his message of repentance, he was also engaged in acts of mercy and love. He was, Matthew tells us, healing every disease and every affliction. And the people were bringing to him all of their sick, all those who were afflicted and had pain, those who were beset by various diseases, and he's ministering to all of them. And his acts of mercy and love and his healing were so extraordinary that fame begins to spread out from him to all the surrounding areas so that even people beyond the Jordan River are flocking to him to follow him. And the main observation that I want to make here is that people were being drawn to Jesus because of his acts of love, not because of his message of repentance or his message of judgment, rather. He's proclaiming the judgment of God, but he's enacting the love of God. Because what brings people to repentance is not simply a message of judgment, but a message of judgment embodied in acts of love. And the reason this is, is because God calls us to repentance because he loves us, not because he's angry with us. I'll show you a scene here from Lord of the Rings 
got it up on the screen. I say in faith. I said that the first service and we, it didn't work. But this service, this is going to be it. I had to describe the scene the first service and it wasn't as good as just showing it probably. But, but we've got it here. You all know I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan and um, normally uh, if, if I meet you and you say you don't like Lord of the Rings, I judge you in my heart and I try. <laughs> but uh, it's not because I like dragons and swords and whatnot, right? But one of the things that's so rich about Lord of the Rings, Tolkien was a very devout Christian and he wove all throughout the story great imagery and symbolism and typology of, of Christian truth and pictures of of God and his love and grace and his power. So this is one of my favorite scenes from the movies. And uh, this comes from the first movie. And here, let me just set it up. In the first movie, Bilbo, uh, who's the humble hobbit, is talking to Gandalf, who is a great wizard. And in the narrative, many of you know it, but if you don't know it, in the narrative, there's a ring. And the ring is symbolic of sin and the seduction of sin. And so Bilbo has had this ring and Gandalf is encouraging Bilbo to let it go, to to give it up. And uh, let's see what happens here uh, in this moment. That's good. We'll stop it. Stop it there. You just let it play. It's just so good. But... <laughs> I've made uh, no secret in sermons past about the season of anxiety that I had a few summers ago and how coming out of all that anxiety, my perspective about Jesus, God's love, God's judgment even has changed. And I've seen that scene many times. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movies. It's always been one of my favorite scenes. But what I had never noticed before was how Bilbo didn't repent until after Gandalf became meek and mild again. Bilbo didn't repent into the arms of Gandalf, great and terrible. He repented into the arms of Gandalf, meek and mild. Wrath and judgment awaken us to the folly of our sin, like smelling salts under the nose. But a message of judgment by itself leaves no room for repentance. What would that scene have been like if Gandalf had never come out of the transfigured, thundering moment? Would Bilbo have run into his arms whimpering? 
He might have cowered in fear and in servile obedience given up the ring against his will, but he would not have run with love into Gandalf's arms. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God, it's revealed against all the wickedness of the world. It's meant to awaken us to the folly of our sin. But in Romans 2.14, the next chapter, Paul says, do you not know that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance? The coming wrath, the judgment of God, makes us aware of our need to repent. But it is God's kindness that enables us to repent. Because human beings will never repent into the arms of wrath, only into the arms of of divine love. And that's why Jesus embodied God's love with actions of kindness and compassion so that we would know that God's call to repentance comes from his heart of love for us. God doesn't start with wrath. Wrath is not his first or his second or his third or even his fourth move. But sometimes we can become so entangled in our sin that we can't get free of it. And then God transfigures himself and he thunders over us to bring us to our senses. Not because he has stopped loving us, but because he loves us. He sees the end result of where our sin will take us and he knows that if left unchecked, it will ruin us. And so he gets big and scary sometimes, and he warns us of the coming judgment. But even when he gets big and scary, he never stops loving us. He doesn't stay big and scary. He doesn't stay transfigured. He makes himself humble and tender and imminent again so that we can repent into his arms of love. Because we will never repent into God's terror. We will only repent into his love. This relationship between wrath and love, I think it's so important for us to understand in our own relationship with God and how we negotiate our relationship with God and the things that he asks of us. It's also important for us to understand as parents or pastors or teachers or small group leaders or friends or for anyone responsible for heralding the message of repentance that Jesus has given to us. If we only preach a message of coming judgment and wrath, we will actually impede repentance because people won't repent into the arms of wrath. But if we only preach a message of God's love that leaves out the truth of judgment, we will also impede repentance. Because what's the point of repenting if there is no day of judgment? Back in the day, a number of years ago, one of my uh, kids was struggling with Spanish class, no habla espanol, which it wasn't so much a problem. They couldn't speak Spanish, but no hablo espanol either. I couldn't speak Spanish either, so it was hard to help them. So the main problem, though, it seemed to me, was a lack of motivation. So my method of correction was to point out the child's failing grade and to warn them about the coming exam, the day of judgment, at the end of the semester. Hey, I see you're failing Spanish. Let's get after that. And then the next week, nothing has improved. And so with a bit more intensity, I see you're still failing Spanish. You have an exam at the end of the semester. Let's get after that. And then the following week, with even more intensity, you're failing Spanish. You have an exam. You're going to fail the exam. You're going to fail the class. You got to get in the gear. Let's get going. So for the first half of the semester, my parenting strategy was to rely upon a heavy dose of reality therapy, pointing out the child's failures and warning the child of the coming judgment at the end of the semester. But none of it made a difference. So one week I said, how about you and I set aside some time each day and we'll learn Spanish together. And I switched from a judgmental and hostile approach to an imminent, gentler, and kinder approach 
and the child's grade went from 54% to 79% over the course of the rest of the semester. Sometimes I think that we think God is like I was on my first iteration of parenting there, that he sits up in heaven and he points out to us all the places that we're failing and he warns us about the coming day of judgment. And then we do our own discipleship, as it were, in the same way. We come alongside of people and we think the primary thing we should do, we should point out to them their faults and warn them about what will happen if they don't get their act together. But God did not just sit upon his throne. That isn't how he has interacted with us. He wrapped himself in our mortal flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And he has come to us, and he has put his arm around us, and he has kindly offered to teach us Spanish, to sit with us, and to help us and to learn the things that we need to learn to get prepared for the day of judgment that is coming. The day of judgment must stand. God will put an end to sin. He has to. He can't let it go on forever. But he has come in the person of Jesus to help us get ready for that day. Jesus has not come to us with a stoic look or a furrowed brow or a frown. He has come to us with kindness and gentleness and love because that's the heart of his Father who sent him. God has sent Jesus to warn us of the coming judgment because he loves us and he wants us to be ready for that day. He has come to help us with our problems, to heal us from our diseases, to teach us by example how to love each other. We cannot get there on our own. So appreciated the song that we opened up the service with. The blind cannot see simply by opening their eyes. It takes more than just opening your eyes to see if you're blind. The whole point of being blind is you opening your eyes doesn't work. We can't sort our lives out on our own. We don't make ourselves right by just deciding to act right. right? There are things inside of us, sin has a hold of us that must be dealt with by the power of God. But with the help of Christ and his grace, he can make us fit for the day of judgment. The gospel message is that God is a holy God. He is the great judge of all the earth who is committed to putting things right. And because that is true, we must repent. But the gospel message is also a message that God loves us and that through the grace and kindness and forgiveness of Jesus, he will make us fit for that day. No one has sinned beyond God's grace. No one is too far gone to be healed by his touch and made whole. Isaiah 118 records the words of the Lord to the nation of Israel, which is the same words that God preaches to us. God says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Turn to the one who loves you, who is so committed to your well-being that he has taken your sins and made an end of them. In the death of Jesus, he offers you salvation free of charge, not because you have spiritual fruit, but so that you can have spiritual fruit. The holy God of judgment is a tender God of love, and he will make you holy if you give your life into his care. Father, we thank you that you did not leave us alone in our sin caressing the ring of power that would only in the end undo us and ruin us. That you have come and you have befriended us. You have met us where we're at. 
You've asked us to trust you. And even at times, Lord, in some of our lives, we've needed to be scared into turning to you. But we thank you, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us always as a God of love and that we can repent into arms of love. And God, I pray for any here today that that need to do that, I pray that you would cause them to turn to you and to trust you, to believe that you have their best interest in mind and that in your grace you would cause them to meet you in your holiness and to become holy as you are holy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.